Hello there, and welcome to the Dear Dyslexic podcast series brought to you by Rethink Dyslexia, the podcast where we're breaking barriers and doing things differently. I'm Shay Wissell, your host, and I'm so glad you can join us. I'm a fellow neurodivergent, and I'm coming from the lands of the Rwandru people of the Kulin Nation, where I live and work. And I would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to all the tribes across our beautiful country and to all First Nations people listening today. Our podcast was born in 2017 out of a need to give a voice to the stories and perspectives of adults with dyslexia. And our voice has grown stronger year after year. We're now a globally listened to podcast with guests from all around the world. Join us for insightful conversations about living with dyslexia and other neurodivergences across all walks of life. Our special focus is on adult education, employment, social and emotional well-being, and entrepreneurship. We're excited to be bringing you this episode and invite you to like and follow us, or even better, why not leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform? So let's get started. I'm very excited today. I've got Mark on the show from I Am Lex. Is that right? Oh, Mark will explain anyway. <laughs> And we are here to talk about all things dyslexia. Mark's in the Netherlands at the moment, and I was just saying to him before we jumped on board that uh, this is my first interview with someone that far away from Australia. So welcome to the show, Mark. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm, I'm actually currently in, in Prague, uh, Czech Republic, <laughs> but still, uh, still, you know, uh, in the neck of the woods, Central Europe. Oh, my God. Um, yeah, no, it's totally fine. It's... it's uh, it's really, I love being here. I love, I, I'm originally from San Francisco. So being so far away from home and being submerged into the European culture is just incredible. I would love to go to Australia though. I've never been. I think that's the next on my bucket list. Well, hopefully you've got better geography than me and you'll know how to get here. <laughs> so I um, came across you on LinkedIn, which is where I find a lot of my fantastic guest speakers and watched your TED talk as well, and was really excited to have the opportunity to speak to you today. So can you um, ex- talk to me a little bit about where you grew up? I know you just said America, but what life was like for you growing up and when you were diagnosed with dyslexia? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I grew up in uh, San Francisco Bay Area, not directly in the city, but you know, uh, my family, uh, we lived in a few places around in the Bay Area. Um, but, uh, I was diagnosed at the age of six. Um, so this happened in, in first grade. Um, it was really attributed to the fact that I was not progressing and really kind of, um, you know, just going into my shell and, um, crumpling up my homework and stuffing on the bottom of the bag and really not interested in, in anything that had to do with education. I was more interested in playing and imagining and, and storytelling. Um, and, uh, and so my parents decided to homeschool me. So they took me out of school, um, which was pretty hard, uh, because I was isolated from all the friends that I was making and, and preschool and kindergarten and first grade, um, and was, uh, put into a homeschooling group with, uh, usually older, some older kids. And through that, it was just a lot of testing and a lot of um, resource classes. I was still going to the same school that I was took out, taken out of and going to the resource program, special education program. Um, and it was really hard for me. I, I remember a lot of times crying and um, not wanting to go. And it, it was like almost like physical pain because some of the tests, some of the things that they had me doing, I was doing a lot of testing through uh, Berkeley uh, uh, University. And um, at that time, I think they were really focused on it being a visual, um, you know, a a vision kind of issue. So it was a lot of like eye tests. They were like throwing a ball. I was falling with my eyes. I was reading on a computer and they were, you know, registering where my eye movement is. And I had to do some tests where they would put papers on the other side of the wall. I would cover an eye and be reading the lines. And it was just awful. (laughs) It was terrible. Um, But but again, I was home, which I loved to be. And I was with my my mom. 
and I was able to be myself. And, um, you know, we had a big backyard, so I spent most of the time playing and just enjoying myself. There wasn't a lot of pressure, which was really great. Um, but eventually, after seven years of being homeschooled, uh, they decided to put me into a, a small private uh, junior high. So um, I was held back a couple grades. So I was the oldest, the tallest person in my class, which was okay. You know, that didn't, I, I was, did, it wasn't hard for me to make new friends or to kind of submerge myself into this new culture. I think I remember it was a hard ju- adjustment period because I wasn't able to socialize so much with kids my age. Um, so it took me a while to really adjust to all of the, things that you learn through all those grades and being, you know, going through all those conflicts. I remember one of my first fights, I was like shaking because I just never experienced this kind of uh, situation. But, uh, but through that time, I was still going to the resource classes and the special education classes. Uh, and I remember that was hard because I, I had to walk through a classroom in order to get to the special ed uh, room and the classroom usually had older kids in it, like eighth graders, or even the, you know, this, this school went up to high school. So there was ninth graders sometimes. So I had to walk through an active class and everyone would stop and they would look at me. And I remember I just felt so small and just so stupid and, and so judged. And, uh, I re- I really just, didn't look forward to doing that, but I had to, I needed the help. I needed, I needed somebody to walk me through the the examinations and, and tell me with the homework and the reading because my reading level was just so far behind. Um, but it was, it was very, I think it was very uh, important. It was very nece- necessary because um, I would, I wouldn't have been able to pass or, or progress. But at the same time, I felt like it just wasn't me and that, and it just didn't make sense why I had to be doing this. And I just wish I didn't, I wish I could be different. And I think this is where I really learned to hide and bottle up uh, my difference and to really, um, you know, never talk about it, never, um, never share my experience, never, you know, just lie about it, essentially. Uh, You know, people ask, why are you going in that room? What are you doing? And I would just make up excuses or just say, you know, wouldn't tell the truth. I think this was very damaging for me as a kid. But at the same time, it was my coping mechanism. um, And there really wasn't any sort of way around it. Touched on so many different areas of challenges for particularly young people as they go through into what we would call secondary school over here and the hiding and the um, lying. So how did you, and I mean, that sounds like a harsh word, doesn't it? But it is, it's a coping. But it's true. It's, it is very lying. Yeah. I mean, you know, because, you know, some of the, some of the kids and some of the people I've dealt with, you know, the R word was thrown around quite a bit. Um, and uh, name calling and, and throwing rocks or some of the kids in my resource class that were more, um, you know, they had more problems than I, I did, um, would get beat up, you know, the bullying and the, and the, just the ridicule and judgment and mistreatment was, it's just so real and it continues on. So yeah, the lying was the only way for us to feel like there's some way to avoid this. And it's, it's, it's a shame. So how did you um, support your mental health? Was there anything that your family were able to do during that time? Or was it all internalized until you got out into the big wide world where we're still picked on, but there's different ways of managing it as we progress into adulthood? Yeah, I mean, I think that... Um, you know, at the time, mental health and this this topic was just, of course, not discussed at all. Um, it was very taboo uh, when I was growing up. Um, I think for me, I you know, I I think for anyone who's neurodivergent or dyslexic, 
um, we all have had this and I've, and I've learned to recognize the, the depression and to recognize the mental health, uh, impact it has, um, together with the, uh, you know, euphoria and creativity and all of that. It's like yin and yang. But, um, I mean, as a kid, it was, it was really, I think that I escaped in my mind and my stories, um, and my imagination, uh, and just, um, isolation. A lot of the times I got into, uh, skateboarding and ex extreme kind of sports. So I think that was also my way of dealing with it is I just pushed myself, um, kind of did things that could really have harmed me, but it was my way of just rebelling against my body and, and my, and my experience, of course, uh, also in high school, um, drugs and alcohol was a way to escape as well. And, and being around wrong kids and, and getting into trouble was, was another not really great coping mechanism, but, uh, a lot of us go there. Uh, and I, I've, I've had, I've heard similar experiences. Um, and so this was, this was kind of my way of, of dealing with it. And, um, and in my senior year of high school, um, I think before, you know, my, my freshman, sophomore, junior year, I decided not to do the resource class because it was just too much, too much judgment. And, you know, I'm, I'm like a young adult and I just didn't, you know, I, I, I couldn't handle it as, as, a, as in high school because they, they were more brutal than, than ever. Um, and this is where I was failing. I was, you know, I was ready to drop out. I was ready to really just give up. And my senior year, I, I made a change and I stopped doing all those harmful things. Um, really sat down and focused on what I wanted to do for my future and for, you know, the, the topic of college and all of this was coming up and, you know, going to all these uh, pre SATs and all these things where I just was doing horrible, but I was just thinking, what am I going to do with my life? I need to crack down. I need to really pass and, and graduate. Um, and I think that one thing that I really hooked on to that really helped with my mental health was cooking. I loved cooking. I wanted to, I, you know, I was like, I'm not going to get into any college. I'm not going to really be able to do anything academic other than culinary arts. So I signed up for a course through um, my high school, uh, connected to another high school called Serendipity Program for culinary arts for, for uh, high school students. And we did cooking competitions. I would wake up at 6 or 6 a.m., sometimes 5.30 a.m., make like, you know, 200 cupcakes and just like be with other kids that were also wanting to be chefs and 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 to cook. And so that was, I think, a really amazing way for me to just to like be myself and, you know, make people happy through my cooking and just uh, grow into something that I, I absolutely love. I'm smiling a lot here because that's exactly what I was going to do when I was in high school. Even though I didn't know I was dyslexic, um, I was really good at cooking and I loved it. And so that I started on that trajectory, but uh, didn't end up becoming a qualified chef. But I still love to cook. So it's interesting that you found that passion and that skill set in cooking. Mm -hmm. But was there something pivotal that made you sit down to think, I need to change my ways? Because that's at such a young age, and I've heard some um, other people I've interviewed, they've had a similar thing at their, when they're in their later years of secondary school, something happens and they realize that they need to change the trajectory or it could not go the way they really want it to. So was there anything pivotal or do you think it was just as you progressed through high school and you found cooking? I mean, I think that, um, I mean, from, you know, when, when I was, I think it was my junior year and I was just absolutely failing everything just like, and the teachers were having meetings with my parents and, and sending in letters and just saying, you know, he's not going to be able to graduate. Um, he's not going to get into college. I've had a lot of, you know, teachers saying, you know, you're not going to make anything of yourself. You know, it was, it was really just this constant, you know, bringing you down. 
Um, but I did have, I did have, uh, especially in the resource, uh, resource teachers, um, my special education teachers, but they're always encouraging me and saying, you're going to do great. I had one in particular that was saying, you know, one day I'm going to look you up, you know, 15 years from now, and I'm going to just be so impressed and you're going to just blow everyone out of the, out of the water. And I think that's, that was a, a pivotal mo- moment where I knew that I could do something for myself. I could make something of myself if I really stop, um, you know, stop doing, you know, stop drinking and, and smoking and these kind of things that were harmful, hanging out with this bad kind of skateboarding crew. And um, there was just a moment where I just realized, like, this is just not for me and it's not healthy and I don't feel good and I need to take control of my life. Um, so I think this was a moment that I really... I uh, saw that, you know, that I can make something of myself, but I think that later in life, um, you know, when, when I, I graduated and I ended up moving to Europe, um, uh, when I met my wife, uh, this was 16 years ago. And, um, I realized that being a chef, it takes a lot more energy and effort. And I love weekends and, and holidays. And if you're a chef, you don't get weekends and holidays. So uh, I really decided that I need to pursue a career in advertising and and mass media and communication, which was, you know, like I said, I, I'm a storyteller. I love living in this world. And that's, that's where, you know, that's a great industry for, for people like me. And I think this is when I started seeing the connection to my dyslexic thinking and my, you know, unique way of looking at big picture and, and, you know, problem solving. And I think this is what was a pivotal moment where it's like, okay, I think this could actually be the career for me. It's something that I could really love and really do. And I saw that my dyslexia actually will help with this. It took me a while to realize that, but I, I started seeing how that those two and two come together. And so this was, I think, a, a pivotal moment for me as well. Going back to um, when you're at school, it's interesting that there's, you know, it's so important for teachers and the support people around us to have that positive attitude for us because it really can make or break us. And I remember mm-hmm. going to secondary school Uh, in year 10, which is two years before everyone graduates. And I remember one of the teachers sitting me down and saying, you'll regret this for the rest of your life. And at the time I was thinking, don't be ridiculous, I hate school. But it enabled me to get into university if it wasn't for him sitting me down. And I think that it's there's definitely a need for educators to be aware of, you know, the impact of how they can make and break us in that sense as well. And I'm excited to hear, you know, how you're able to, turn it around and then as you progress through adulthood start to see the positives of being dyslexic because especially after being faced with so many adversities and so much negativity I think it can be really hard for people to start to see their dyslexia as something positive. We talk a lot about you know coming from a strength-based approach and everyone has strengths and so I'd love for you to talk more about how you started to leverage those strengths and end up on a TED talk. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, I, I graduated, um, and once you graduate, all of the help, all of the support goes away. You're alone in the world. Your dyslexia is not gone. Sometimes it's even worse, um, because the stress of the world and and situations and real kind of responsibility amplify the dyslexic, um, moments and, and, and these just really intense feelings. Um, and, but again, I was determined. I, I, you know, I, I was determined that I wanted to be a creative director and I wanted to make amazing ads and I wanted to be connected with incredible brands. And this was just my dream. So I kept it hidden. I, I made sure that I didn't want to be treated differently. I didn't want, um, I didn't want anybody to know that I was impaired because I was, um, but I, I, I could get past it. I've learned to, to get past this. I've learned different ways and techniques to hide it and to avoid it. Um, not all the time, 
it always slips through even when even if you checking an email 100 times and I would listen to my emails five times over and over. Um, it was before Grammarly. So uh, I was using Microsoft Word sometimes to check it. And it was horrible. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I just, I just pushed and pushed. Um, it got me into a lot of trouble uh, keeping it hidden sometimes because, you know, it was, it was apparent that there was something different about me. Um, but I just kept denying it and I kept hiding it and I learned to overcome and, and, and I was able to, you know, work with some incredible, um, clients and great projects. Um, I started in advertising in, in Prague. So I was working at one, uh, Young and Rubicam was one of the first agencies and they hired me as, you know, this is before social media was actually a, a business platform. Um, so I was really getting their clients and understanding together with the digital kind of focus of creativity and marketing, um, with social media and with other avenues. Um, and just, you know, with, with my, with being Lex, um, I was able to, uh, you know, submerge myself and, and kind of be this multidisciplinary, even though I didn't know what I, how to do, I, I just, my abilities with my dyslexia helped me to kind of learn to do everything and learn it fast, you know, to really solve that problem quickly. And so, you know, they would put me on a client they'd be like, okay, well, we need to um, make some content. And I said, okay, give me a camera. I'll shoot it. I'll learn how to edit it. I will post it. I'll write the copy. I will figure out how to boost it. You know, I kind of do everything. And I think this was a really great way for me to learn super fast to show my abilities. And I, over time, started recognizing like, you know, that's it's because of my dyslexia, I was able to really jump into these things that were kind of uh, foreign to me and um, give it my all and, and learn fast and adapt and be a yes man, you know, just really um, not be afraid of that. But, um, over time I started to really get exhausted from not being able to open up about my greatest strength as my, as a result of my greatest weakness. And, um, I had situations in client meetings where I put champagne instead of campaign, <laughs> big head header, <laughs> Um, and I wasn't able to laugh at myself and say, you know, like to just go with it. And, and clients would, would insult me and, and ridicule me in front of everyone. Um, which, you know, I learned to have thick skin and deal with difficult clients. Cause that's what advertising is all about. But at the same time, um, you know, I'd have situations with my managers and, and things where, I, I should have been open about it. I should have told them. I should have had this discussion so I would avoid these situations because in their mind, I was just lazy and stupid and not listening and um, disobedient. You know, these are the kind of things. And, and that wasn't the case. I just wasn't being supported properly. Um, and uh, when when the pandemic hit, um, I was working at publicist group and they, uh, let go all the freelancers cause I was freelancing at the time. Most of us in the advertising world are freelancers. And, uh, I decided, you know, this was a perfect moment for self-reflection, um, and to really, you know, understand that I need to get a better handle of understanding my dyslexia and, and communicating my dyslexia to everyone around me. Uh, but I was afraid because I thought if I was to vocalize it, I would get fired and I would not get projects. And, um, you know, I, I would look at, I would be looked at as <clears throat> a, you know, as some, someone that would just take too much effort, effort or time or resources in order to support, to be a part of something. But it was a perfect moment for me to, you know, like sit down and start building out this idea that I had with I am Lex 
um, and to map it out. And everyone was taking Zoom calls. So I was able to like start actually talking to people online and knocking on screens, as I was calling it. Um, and the, the whole idea of I am Lex was coming from this aspect that we can't even spell our own disability. You know, I can't even spell dyslexia, let alone neurodiversity. So um, being in branding and advertising, I thought this is a perfect opportunity to take my skills, what I've been learning, what I've been doing, and put it towards my community and put it towards rebranding the identity of, of dyslexia that is ridden with misconceptions and stereotypes Everybody thinks they know what dyslexia is, but the truth is that, you know, it is, it's based on outdated research and outdated way of thinking. And uh, so I, I thought, okay, let's make an acronym for our strongest attributes, leadership, endurance, and exploration. And this is where Lex was born. And um, I just started sharing it with everybody that I could, just spreading it out very open about it. I didn't put it on my LinkedIn still. I, I still was keeping it hidden because I still needed to get projects and I was still afraid of this. But finally, um, I was able to connect with the International Dyslexia Association and incredible, um, you know, advocates and organizations and got great feedback. And then I got the opportunity um, through my university, um, uh, UNYP, in Prague to do a TEDx, to um, audition for a TEDx. And my mentor at the time, um, he's, his, he had his, his dad had dyslexia, his brother had dyslexia. So when I opened up the topic of what, what I wanted to talk about, he said, well, people already know what that is. Like, you know, is there really anything new to learn about dyslexia? And just after five minutes, I kind of blew his mind because you know, he was the first person that was criticizing people online for their spelling and grammar. And I said, hey, man, that could have been your brother or your dad. You don't know who you're talking to. You know, you don't know who that other person on their side, where they're at and, and what kind of advantages or disadvantages they have um, with their neurodiversity or their life. And so uh, they welcomed me on the stage. And this is this was my come out moment. I came out there first time communicating it to the world and it was exhilarating and scary but I just felt like finally I can be who I am and never never have to hide again behind it um, and take on the challenge and yeah it was just brilliant at Rethink Dyslexia we are doing things differently as a global leader in creating inclusive environments for adults with dyslexia, our commitment is to provide individuals with opportunities to live healthier, happier, and more connected lives. Through our range of tailored services, including coaching, learning and development programs, consultancy, and training, we're helping dyslexic individuals, businesses, and organizations to better understand and support their dyslexic employees. So if you're looking for insights, inspiration, and expert advice, on dyslexia and how you can provide inclusive practices and environments, then head to rethinkdyslexia.com to find out more or book your free consultation today. Such a powerful story and you've touched on so many different topics around the challenges that we face as adults and, you know, as soon as we leave school, if there were any supports in place, they are all stripped away and to you know, end up on a stage coming out like that but do we use the word coming up in the way we do? You know, we, we, are, we it are. is, it is, you know, it's like the closest comparison, you know, really, because it's like you, you, yeah, I'm not saying coming out of the closet. I, I'd say I use the term coming out of our shells, you know, because we're like shelled in kind of like these eggs, you know, just hiding and, and, you know, like in the fetal position and just wanting to be this child that's taken care of and we need to break through. It's hard to break through. And a lot of the times we don't have help to break through. But once we do, we're free, we're out, we can spread our wings and we can fly. What a beautiful analogy. I can see it all in pictures right now <laughs> to get it drawn up if you haven't got it drawn up already. But, <laughs> and, and, um, 
I mean, your story is so exciting and I think that it will be of such benefit to our listeners to hear um, your journey and the adversity you've faced. And it really does emphasise the resilience and persistence, those skills that uh, we dyslexics possess and we build on because of the different types of adversity we face. And how has the response been now since you've been out? You're still getting projects? Yeah, I'm getting projects. Um, it's, you know, I look at it as kind of a case study, um, and a, uh, just a, a chance for me to, uh, use my vulnerabilities, um, to help, to help the, the future, um, dyslexics that are, are going to be talking to the same managers and the same hiring HR and, and, and talent acquisition people, um, and plant the seed in their mind. If they didn't know what dyslexia was, or never met somebody like me that was open, that even if I don't get a positive response from them, that it's still in their mind. They, you know, I kind of broke broke the barrier. Um, so I've had positive. I've also had negative. I've I've had some interviews where even I had some people walk out after I I talked about my dyslexia. Um, kind of like, oh, I don't have time for this. And, you know, just this, again, this stigma, but in, in one of the interviews where the person walked out, there was a guy afterwards who kind of slowly raised his hand and he's like, cause I said, you know, you don't, you guys don't even know, like you have a lot of neurodivergent and dyslexic employees right now that either know or don't know, um, and are probably like me afraid to come out. And he kind of rose his hand. He's like, I also have dyslexia and everybody turned their head at him. Like, like what, you know, there's one among us. And I think even if I didn't get a positive response, even if they ghost me after that interview and didn't follow up with the test project, they told me they would give me. um, I knew that that was at least I opened up the book for this guy to, to be, you know, to be open about it and, and for the HR to recognize, okay, you know, maybe, this is something we need to focus on because, you know, a lot of these businesses now, the trend is, you know, this diversity, equality, inclusion programs, you know, it's like 94% of businesses are, you know, uh, focusing on DEI and and their, in their companies, but only, I think it's around 4% actually include neurodiversity or, or disability in these programs. Um, and considering the mass population of people, um, it's super important. So, uh, but I, I also, I got a recent project with one of one, uh, advertising agency that, um, I've been pursuing forever, um, good Silverstein and partners, and they're the ones who did the got milk campaign and, uh, they have a master class where uh, Rich Silverstein um, talks about his dyslexia and uh, they're very open about it. They're very supportive about it. So I think that this was one thing where I, as a dyslexic, it's super important for not only my me as an employee to fit with the business, but for them to fit with me as well. It needs to be a perfect fit. And you need to find that environment where you'll be supported because if you're not, it's not, it's not for us. It's not right for us. So I think this helps to filter out these places that I knew I wouldn't be successful um, and to find those those niches and those organizations and those agencies and brands that are open and supportive of the neurodivergent movements. And so I think that's been really incredible. And for me, it's fascinating to hear because I'm about to hopefully soon submit my thesis and I've written three papers, oh, and um, two of them are focused on this topic that you're talking about across the employment lifestyle life cycle. But at the moment, um, it's all Australian based because we've never had anything like this undertaken in Australia. So for me, it's really interesting to hear that this is happening in Europe as well because I've always thought that Australia is lagging behind, particularly for adults. Before I started Dear Dyslexic, there were no adults really talking about dyslexia seven or eight years ago, and that's exploded in the last eight years, which has been amazing. But I would have thought that Europe would have been leading the way, like the UK has 
been leading the way. Yeah. And it's really fascinating to hear that this is a reoccurring, this is a, an occurrence across the world that I would have yeah. thought, um, I would have thought Europe was a better place to be supporting dyslexic adults. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I think there's a lot of work to be done. Um, you know, the U.S. is is very, it's very, uh, it's more open to this. I mean, especially when it comes to kids um, uh, and the, the youth, I think there's a real big focus and there's a lot of help. Um, of course, you know, it is uh, expensive. You know, there are a lot of families that can't afford this. But when it comes to adults, it's still, it's still very, uh, you know, in Europe and America, it's still very far behind. Um, but yeah, UK, I see that it's really kind of exploding, especially with the ADHD kind of uh, communication and, and movement and, and autism and dyslexia, of course. Um, but uh, but still, I think there's so much work to be done and, and so much more needed. Um, and again, I, I think it is a lot of it is, it is attributed to these businesses. It's scary. The word dis- neurodiversity or dyslexia or dyscalculia and you know, all these things is scary because they think the worst. They think, you know, they think this autism and they think this Tourette syndrome and, and all these things that are just so foreign to them. And they think first thing they jump to is how much is this going to cost me to support it? You know, this is the first thing. So, um, and is, is it going to, you know, impair my business and, you know, is it going to scare off clients, but there's statistics showing that neurodivergent teams are, uh, basically can create more profit for businesses that it actually, you know, like uh, Deloitte did an amazing uh, analysis of this talking about neurodiversity in the workplace and how, you know, they, they were showing like 33% of teams with nerd with neurodivergent employees are, are more effective and businesses are making more money and getting more clients. And, you know, because it's, you know, the, what the millennial and Gen Z uh, are are most uh, interested in is purpose products. When there's a purpose behind a, a, an organization or a product or you know something that that is actually trying to do good for the world, we are more uh, accepting of it and we're more trusting of it. And so I think that it's slowly growing. It's getting there. I think people are becoming less scared um, of the words. And I think this is where I am Lex comes in because I, I, I like the idea of using Lex as kind of restarting the conversation because people ask, well, what is that? You know, you know, it's so they, their bias is gone. They start from zero. And this is when I can basically re-educate them about how it's an acronym for dyslexia and, and it's kind of rebranding because we, you know, shorten everything for modern appeal these days. Um, so it's a way of kind of reintroducing then the movement so that the future leaders and, and managers will be more accepting of this because they see the benefits that are emerging from, from these great data and analysis that's coming out. Oh, I could talk to you for hours about this topic <laughs> and uh, around the workplace because that is my passion. Um, but I won't bore our listeners with uh, my ongoing rants around <laughs> what needs to change. But is there something that um, you could leave our listeners with around what's been, you know, some tips or anything that you think might be helpful, particularly for young listeners that might be out there that are, or adults that are in the workplace that are too scared to say, I'm dyslexic. There are so many of us out there and for many reasons. Um, is there anything that you think you could leave them with apart from them watching your amazing TED Talk? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think that the most important thing that, that I wish I could go back in time and tell my and tell myself the young adult that was struggling and afraid to mention his dyslexia is that um, there really isn't anything to be afraid of to say it. 
all it will do if you're open about it, um, however open you want to be or where and, and part of your, your career. I know people are not so excited to put it on their CVs or anything like that, but still, if you're open about it, it, it leaves room for more protection for you. It leaves room for more support that is out there and also indication if this is the right place for you to be, because it's super important. You may be really trying to make it work, but if you don't have that support or understanding because dyslexia doesn't go away and it will always be a part of your working mentality, um, to have to be open about it and to, to, to share it will help to protect, um, your, you know, your future and your career and your, your current job, um, but I think that also it's really important to, I mean, what I would what I would say is to really focus on your passions, focus on the things that make you happy, that you feel you're the best at, and really um, try to focus in on how to how to make that a part of your career and your life, and to find something that fits within that. Because that, as as a dyslexic that is where you will be most comfortable that is where you'll be most successful and never try to be what people are packaging or putting you in this box always come out of that box always pursue the things that you're most passionate about that you're most comfortable with um, and you will be successful because you will be happy and you will be um, doing the things that you know you're good at um, so this is this is what I would I would definitely suggest. Such a positive note to end our conversation on. And I think one of the things that's really resonated for me is that if you do disclose, like you did in some of your interviews, and you don't get the job or they walk out, which is a terrible situation, the fact that you've planted the seed, you know, that you know, there'll be there will be a conversation had. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, planting the seed is what we need to start doing um, and being brave like you've talked about through the whole show um, has been wonderful and I really think that the stuff you talked about will be inspirational and very helpful to our listeners. So thank you so much for coming on the show. My evening, you're more... Thank you so much. I have to look up my yeah. notes again, geography. I didn't do well in geography, I must admit. <laughs> yeah, either. Yeah, either. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for connecting. And um, we can't wait to watch what happens with I Am Lex in the future. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, you can find the, the it's TEDx UNYP. And the title of the talk is Rebranding Dyslexia, I Am Lex. We'll have all of that information up on the website when we um, broadcast the podcast. So thank you again. And thank you, everyone, for listening and we look forward to talking to you again shortly. Thank you. If you haven't done so already, make sure you sign up to our mailing list so you can keep up to date with everything we are doing at Rethink Dyslexia. So head to rethinkdyslexia.com.au. And don't forget, if there's anything you heard today that was distressing, you can contact Lifeline on 13 11 14 or Beyond Blue on 1300 22 46 36. Thanks for listening. And bye for now. Uh.